I've decided to write the, the textbook, um, which is Information Systems, a Manager's Guide to Harnessing Technology. Um, and it's meant to be an introductory um, textbook in the field of information systems, blending technology and business. And uh, you know, the reason I decided to, to go ahead and, and write this was um, you know, I was sort of struggling in that I wanted to get some content out there. And yet, I also found that there were problems with conventional publishing. For example, you know, I've been teaching at BC for 14 semesters, but I only used a conventional text one of those semesters. And I go back uh, you know, every year and, and evaluate the texts that are on the market, but I really wasn't able to find anything that had motivated um, my students. In fact, only the first semester I, I'd used a text, and I supplemented it with, um, frankly, readings that we were able to get from the library's wonderful electronic resources, Forbes, Fortune, Business Week, The Wall Street Journal, The Effectiva. And while the students loved the um, electronic version of, of the press, package um, and were able to build living cases around that. They uniformly did not like the text. They, um, many management texts tend to read like an encyclopedia. Um, and, uh, and so that was a challenge. Now, um, uh, teaching from a, a course pack really works. Um, the problem is a lot of that material goes out of date very quickly. So there may be some wonderful, durable, strategic nuggets and theory nuggets that I want my students to have that was in an article that was written five years ago, but everything else in that bit was um, uh, is out of date. So I wanted to write something that was very current for our students as well. And unfortunately, most publishers have about a two-year lag time to get a project off the ground and to get it out to students. And that doesn't work when you're studying Facebook and Google and Netflix and a bunch of other firms that work at internet speed. The other um, I issue that, that I felt very close to is the fact that um, textbooks are, are extremely expensive and the average textbook price in our field is about 180 bucks. That's a challenge for an author because if you write something that you are very proud of, um, there is a disincentive to adopt uh, another book at 180 bucks. You, you really can't assign two books like that to your students. And in fact, you know, textbooks at that price tend to be all or nothing. Either I'm going to use one textbook or the other textbook, but I'm not going to use both of them at the same time. So those three things sort of got in the way. Then this new sort of open publishing model came along, which allowed me to be able to leverage the sort of rapid pace um, uh, interest that I had in, in covering contemporary issues and to be able to get that content out very quickly in a variety of different formats to the widest audience that, that I felt I could reach and to have a scholarly impact that way. So the benefits that, that one gets by um, working for an op through an open source model is number one, the, the model is very quick. Um, just to give you an idea, I had finished the, um, the current version of the textbook. It's uh, titled 1.1, although it's really version 2, I suppose you could say. Um, and I'd finished that in, uh, on June 1st of this year. And by mid-July, six weeks later, the entire editorial process was done. The book was being printed and, and was available for purchase. And the digital copies were already available online as well. Um, What's also interesting is that the publisher gave me a lot of flexibility. I actually had uh, unedited drafts of chapters that were online. And um, you know, as a, an author, it was very rewarding to have universities demand a beta version of the book in print before the final editing was done. So it sent a real strong signal, at which, uh, which was great and, and motivating. Um, the other thing that's interesting about the model, too, is, is um, you know, it's available free online and for a very low cost for the starting print edition. So black and white softback edition is $29.95. Now what's special about that is that while faculty wouldn't adopt a second $180 textbook, they've been very quick to say, you know, adopt a chapter on cloud computing or on information security or some other um, you know, high turnover content uh, piece where there's still durable theory in it. And um, you know, what we found that some of the universities have seen is that they would adopt one or two chapters in cutting edge areas. And then they'd look at their teaching evaluations at the end of the semester. And the material that we were offering had uh, far higher evaluations in their conventional textbooks. That was the incentive to push them over to um, you know, adopt this textbook in full. That kind of thing is not available for authors using conventional models. So that's why I think that this is just so incredibly disruptive from an author's perspective uh, to be able to reach a, w a wide audience. and. Um, you know, to really uh, speed up the process of adoption of textbooks. You know, another thing that's interesting about having a, a book available online is, uh, number one, it's discoverable online. So faculty could be searching for um, content for a course pack and then run across cases or chapter material that we presented and, and they can find, frankly, via Google. We've also found that students have come to faculty members with um, uh, you know, links to the text online and said, hey, this is material that relates to what we're using. These are more updated cases. And so there's discovery that way. Scholars are sharing links with this information themselves. And I'm actually using social media as well. Um, and you know, that's something I think that's really potentially very valuable for an author. 
For example, um, you know, when there are articles that are related to chapters that I've written, I can post a tweet or a blog post about that and to offer um, some uh, uh, suggestions for faculty to be able to incorporate very contemporary things behind the theory that's in the textbook that we've, uh, that we've got. Uh, another thing that's really interesting about that is when your text is available, you hear from your audience, and your audience is anybody that has computer access. So I've had um, you know, wonderfully motivating letters from faculty in Africa, throughout Asia, where you know, the conventional model of rolling out a very expensive, hardbacked US textbook doesn't fit their needs. And if their students have access to a computer, they have access to all the material that we've created and we've offered up. Another interesting thing about social media and being an author is that this provides you with a two-way mechanism to communicate with your audience. So, uh, for example, there's a, a service called Ning where you essentially roll your own social network like a mini Facebook. And I've got a Ning community that's set up exclusively for faculty that are adopting my textbook and it's free membership. But what's interesting about this is that now I have an electronic forum where um, you know, essentially my customers, other faculty members, are discovering interesting things that are related to the text and they're able to share that information with me. So I'm getting examples, I'm getting video clips, I'm getting other animations that they've discovered online. And so now there's a community of scholars that have come together and said, hey, this is how we can do even a better job in teaching information systems. And so I'm not only sharing information out one way, but I'm also using technology to gather information and to continue to improve subsequent versions of, of what I'm offering and what I'm doing in the classroom. So students can, can access the text in lots of different ways. And, and as a faculty member that wants to reach students and impact students, um, you know, it's wonderful now to be able to leverage technology to present them with this buffet of options. There may be some students that want to read the text on an iPad or a Kindle device. Um, there may be some students that want to read online or to be able to pull up chapters even on their phone if they don't have material with them, if they're traveling, they're coming back from a game. Um, far and away, the most popular option is to buy you know, what we sort of jokingly call the dead tree textbook, the printed and bound version of the textbook. And that version is available in the BC library, but students can also go to the Flat World website in order to direct from them. Uh, students also have the opportunity to buy chapters and print them off one-off as PDFs as well. So all of those different consumption options are available. Flat World even has um, uh, an author reading uh, the audio version of, of each chapter, and those can be bought on a, on a one-off basis too. So from a faculty member's perspective, um, you know, I really don't care how consumer or how students consume my text, if it's online or offline or listening to the audio version and taking notes. Um, giving my students more options, if that's going to increase their um, you know, consumption of the material that we're trying to share, that's a huge win for me. So I actually have a, a copy of the book here. So if you bought the, the print version, um, so this is, is you know, they get a, a, a soft back black and white version for $29.95. What's interesting about that is so that if this competes with a textbook, which is a list price at about 180 bucks, what's happening in the textbook industry today is that there's now a market for textbook rentals. But even at a textbook rental price, a um, $180 textbook will rent for a semester for about 50 bucks. So we're actually even less expensive than the textbook rental market. Now, this is good because students save money, clearly. Um, but it's also good for the faculty and for the publisher as well, because the aftermarket for the text sort of, sort of goes away, as well as, as you know, saving money for the students. And it radically expands the potential adoption market for this as well. So as Ed mentioned, you know, we have folks that are using the textbook worldwide. Now, not only could they get this kind of dead tree version, they can also um, you know, download a version of their laptop. I happen to have a version on the iPad here. And this is actually just showing through the Safari web browser. Now, this is kind of fun, although this is the entire free version. But to give you an example, um, so here's a section that we, w in, in my textbook, which is about creating a social media awareness and response team. And there's a small example of, of uh, a problem that United Airlines had had um, with uh, a customer complaining. And the customer had decided to film a YouTube video, a song. He happened to be a musician. His guitar was broken. And it was uh, a song called United Breaks Guitars. This had received millions of YouTube views in less than a month. Um, but there's also an opportunity for me to actually embed the YouTube video if students want to see that right in the, uh, the application itself. So there are real fun things that we can do in terms of leveraging technology. I think we're just scratching the surface. But as a scholar that studies these kinds of things and, and how technology can be disruptive um, and who is passionately interested in, in benefiting our students and finding uh, better ways to reach them, um, it's really a, a fun project to be involved with. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's actually really fun because um, you know, as a faculty member, I can say, uh, 
you know, this is an example of how a firm screwed up, and this is the new reality of social media where the market can broadcast that screw up, and now you have an opportunity to see that screw up in action. It really resonates with our students, and they're facing a new management reality. So to be able to think about different ways to be able to deliver that to them um, and to make sure that it has an impact on how they conduct themselves as managers and as citizens is, um, is great. Now this um, technology makes it possible for faculty to self-publish. Um, but it's also possible, for example, for a recording artist to self-publish. But there still is a role for that middleman organization. Um, you know, anybody can put something up in iTunes, but there have been you know, uh, precious few bands that have had success. And while there are some authors that have had success in self-publishing, again, those are, are few and far between. And I've decided to work with a publisher because, frankly, they had a number of skill sets that I lacked and that I didn't want to spend time with. For example, uh, they were able to offer editorial, layout, um, graphics creation. They were able to clear image for copyright. Um, they provide a valuable marketing function. And you know, they, they do have a revenue generating model. So um, you know, they also uh, distribute the product and they collect revenue and, and there are author royalties that are offered for any purchase of content that happens through them as well. So all of those things I think provide the right mix to be able to improve the quality of my product um, and really to provide author incentives around it as well. Another reason why I think that the text is, is resonated with um, so many faculty too is that we've been able to have a special Boston College spin on it. For example, um, you know, most folks that study information systems would study a concept called Moore's Law that suggests that technology gets both faster over time or more powerful and it also gets cheaper over time. Well, that also has some really important implications too and as a university that's uh, grounded in being men and women for others, we can explore those. For example, faster and cheaper technology means more technology into the hands of the poor. Well, that means is, is that uh, farmers or fishermen or you know, the majority of the world's, world's poor are involved in some kind of agrarian enterprise. Those folks can now discover markets. They can find out where there are buyers for their products. They can find out if it makes sense to harvest crops or not. Um, and uh, you know, those kinds of things are having a tremendous impact on improving the economic well-being of individuals worldwide. Throughout, throughout Africa, we're seeing mobile phone technology being used, for example, for funds transfer, for banking. Um, you know, it really is changing lives for the better. Now, there's also a flip side to this as well, because um, this kind of technology also leads to rapid obsolescence. Well, uh, individuals and organizations need to think about what happens when that technology is at the end of its life. What happens when products are disposed? And we have a real eye-opening segment of, of one of those chapters that talks about um, how uh, many firms had thought that they were recycling, but they were actually engaged in highly polluting activities. And uh, you know, by not just covering it issues of information systems, but by broadening the critical thinking of our students to make them more responsible managers, I think that that's something that our students want, our faculty want to be conveying to students. And another thing that, that I think is, is really interesting, and uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if the model that I'm working with is necessarily the end model that we'll see with so many scholars moving toward, but um, and I think that this does change the game in terms of uh, you know, what is impactful scholarship. For example, um, you know, like most of the research faculty here at Boston College, uh, I'm engaged in, in what we would define as conventional research. So writing uh, articles for scholarly journals that are consumed by other scholars. And that's very important. We have to continue to have our foot on that gas. But um, there's also another channel here that's been created. And um, you know, uh, from, from my perspective now, I've had an opportunity to capture what we've been doing that's really resonated with our students and frankly with our employers as well. Um, a new way of teaching information systems and to be able to get that content out to as wide an audience as possible. Now, a real tangible result that we've had is that this text has only been out for one year and yet we've had 50% of the U.S. News top rank information systems programs in the country adopt this textbook. Um, frankly, via other mechanisms, I would not have had an opportunity to have such a quick and such a deep impact into how my discipline is delivered to our students. And as a scholar, I've got to say over 14 years, that's the most rewarding research effort that I've been involved in.